we're living in a day and age where many, many animal species and habitats and plant species are either extinct or on their way towards extinction. Zoos have always been an important resource for education and inspiration um, and, and kind of bridging the gap between wildlife and, and humans um, so that people could actually learn about biodiversity and want to save it. But I think zoos have, have come into a time now where they're even more important than that. In some cases, zoos have species or individual animals that are no longer in the wild. I think zoos play a very important role in, in conservation and in sort of a number of fronts. We, um, I grew up going to the zoo. My grandmother took me to the zoo all the time. And I think, I think that's sort of the first step, right? You, you get to the zoo and you learn about these animals that you otherwise would never see. I think that in and of itself is, is a value to conservation. One of the misperceptions that a lot of folks have is that zoos don't participate in conservation. So much of the conservation work um, is behind the scenes and you may not see it. We're not just holding animals in boxes anymore. We're really trying to um, give them a, a high quality of life. And some of them don't have anywhere to go. Some highly endangered species, the only place maybe left for them is zoos right now. Everybody, every, almost every family comes to the zoo at some point. So there's, that audience is tremendously valuable in terms of um, the information, education, and values that you can help impart on, on them. And we hope that by coming to the zoo, they will put a greater value on wildlife and conservation in the future. And so we really think that our greatest impact is there. Um, we can also, of course, directly affect conservation by doing the kinds of species recovery programs. There are a number of roles here at the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research. Some people are uh, looking really with laboratory methods um, and techniques on how to save endangered species, both plants and animals. And then some people are working um, out where species actually occur and trying to re restore ecosystems and um, reintroduce species back into historical ranges. Uh, my name is Chris Tubbs. I'm a scientist in the Reproductive Physiology Division and study molecular endocrinology of endangered species. And what we're particularly interested in in our lab is looking at how chemicals in the environment might affect reproduction of various endangered species and to try to develop sort of new and non-invasive ways to test the potential effects of chemicals on, on those species. The way that we look at, at how chemicals affect reproduction of endangered species in a test tube, that's not done in any other zoo, right? And so, so we're kind of pushing that envelope a little bit in our lab, which is an exciting thing to do. Uh, the Frozen Zoo is a, is a collection, uh, a pretty unique collection of tissues and um, cell lines from a number of, of species. So the Frozen Zoo is an incredible resource. Uh, it's actually the largest frozen zoo in the world and the first one that was ever established back in 1975. And it's just this huge diverse collection of uh, body cells or what we call cell lines, as well as reproductive cells, things like um, sperm and eggs. And again, the Frozen Zoo is um, is a repository for genetic variation, so we can actually use those resources to inform research questions, uh, to um, make sustainable populations of endangered species, and again, you know, reinfuse genetic diversity into populations if, if necessary. My name is Jennifer Toby, and I am a research coordinator. For the past 11 years, I have worked um, with koalas here at the San Diego Zoo. We house Queensland koalas. Um, we have a colony of about 25 to 30 animals that are actually housed on ground. The frozen zoo um, actually contains collection of cell samples from some of the lines of koalas that we have, as well as a plethora of other animals too. But what's unique about it is we have cell lines from the animals that we study out in Australia, so wild animals, as well as our animals here at the San Diego Zoo. And currently we're working on a genetic project where we're looking at the entire population of koalas to determine whether or not once and for all they're different subspecies of each other. And we're using lineages of known animals who bred, who produced, and compare them to their wild counterparts in Australia. 
So we can glean so much information from that that we then take out into the field to figure out what is going on. How are these animals interacting with each other? And how are they finding each other to breed? How are they using their environment? Um, what other factors are going on? We have a lot of success stories um, at the San Diego Zoo. Um, we've been lucky to, to play an integral role in a lot of recoveries. I think probably the most iconic story um, that, that comes to mind when I think of San Diego Zoo Global and conservation, also with our partners, has been the recovery of the California condor. I think it's pretty safe to say that's a species that was going to go extinct without human intervention. Uh, San Diego Zoo Global was able to play a really integral uh, role with our federal partners and with the Los Angeles Zoo, um, Oregon Zoo, other partners like that. Uh, we were able to really you know, decide what's going to save this species as it was on the brink of extinction. And we've done a number of really exciting interventions, whether it was just um, starting a massive captive breeding effort, uh, you know, 20 years ago or just over 20 years ago, there were less than two dozen condors on the planet. Now we're getting close to 450 condors, um, and more than half of those are actually in the wild, uh, flying free over California, uh, Arizona, at the southern rim of the Grand Canyon, down in Baja California, Mexico. My name is Kelly Walker. I'm the senior keeper uh, for the Oregon Zoo at the California Condor Recovery Center. California condors uh, are endangered for a lot of, of different reasons, but the thing that's been the same about 50 years is uh, lead bullets, lead ammunition. Um, when you shoot something using a lead bullet, that lead fragments in the carcass, the condors eat it um, and they die of lead poisoning. But so do um, anything that eats that carcass and that would be golden eagles, bald eagles, ravens, um, turkey vultures, so it's not just condors, it's, a, it's a, a problem across species and people eat that meat too. After a condor lays an egg, um, we normally will pull that out of the nest room and replace it with a dummy egg. So after we pull it, Go ahead and put it in the incubator, and incubation takes 54 to 57 days. We weigh the egg every day to make sure it's losing the right amount of weight. We do what we call candling of the egg, where we put it up um, against a bright light, and we look at all the vesseling, the chick in there, make sure everything is developing correctly. And then when that chick starts to hatch, and then we go ahead, take that hatching egg down, uh, pull the dummy egg out and put the hatching chick under the, the parents. So the parents actually will hatch that chick out and the chick um, will be parent raised at that point. The first chick that we ever released, number 340, actually um, paired with a wild female last year and produced um, their first egg. So um, chicks that we released from here are starting to breed in the wild. So that's again is a, a very prominent species that went extinct in the wild and due to captive rearing, due to zoos, it's been rescued from extinction. Um, you know, I can't say that we're finished with the California condor because we've been successful at preventing the extinction. They're not self-sustaining in the wild yet. And it will actually be, unfortunately, very many more years before we reach that point. Zoos are important for the animals and our community because not only do we build an appreciation for wildlife, we also provide a very important role in providing a home uh, for animals that couldn't go anywhere else. Uh, for example, one of our elephants, Chindra, came from the island of Borneo. She was wandering around in the wild. Uh, the, the jungle that she lived in with her family was being torn down and large palm oil plantations were being put in. So the elephants come out of the jungle foraging and um, actually the local folks consider them more, more of a pest animal. They try to drive them away with fire or firecrackers or shotguns to try to scare them away. But it, that only works for a limited amount of time. Unfortunately, Chindra was found with a gunshot wound to the left side of her face that left her blinded. Uh, Chindra was taken to a rehabilitation center at the edge of the jungle and her life consisted of living on a, on a 50 foot chain. Um, once she was strong enough to leave that rehabilitation center, they couldn't release her into the wild because she wouldn't have survived on her own. And that's where the Oregon Zoo stepped in. Uh, we were able to provide her a home, provide her a herd to join. Uh, since that time, she's witnessed two births. 
She's lived in a multi-generational matriarchal herd, which is a female society, just as she would in her range countries, and she's become a part of that society, uh, a very important part. Phoenix Zoo has a number of conservation projects. They actually started with field conservation work back in 1962 with the Arabian Oryx. And just as we opened the doors for Phoenix Zoo, we were approached by uh, the United Arab Emirates on a project to try and save the Arabian Oryx. We became the home of the world herd of Arabian Oryx, which at that point had gone extinct in the wild. Um, the Arabian Oryx is part of our logo, it's part of our 50th anniversary um, logo. We kind of were the ark for the Oryx. Well, presently, uh, what we do at the Conservation Center is work with local species conservation, and we have about eight different species projects going on. Uh, with narrow headed garter snakes, Chiricahua leopard frogs, uh, black footed ferrets. I also work with Mount Grand Red Squirrel and two native fish species, the Gila top minnow and the desert pupfish. We work with two invertebrates, spring snails, and another species of mollusk called the California floater. We do a number of field conservation efforts in Arizona, such as black food ferret spotlighting. Uh, the group uh, worked together to develop a burrowing owl habitat. Conservation efforts are where you're actually working with the species in support of it in its natural habitat in some way or another, or you're actually working to try and improve the natural habitat of a species. And zoos have trended towards actively improving their natural habitat and repopulating these animals back into the wild in areas where they've actually become declined. Zoos are more than a place just to come to see animals in enclosures. Zoos are places now where you can learn about how animals live, what they need to survive in the wild. And more and more zoos are actively involved in making sure that these animals are surviving in their natural habitat. We're all interested in and passionate about wildlife and animals, and so we want to see them um, continue to exist in the future uh, for our ancestors. We don't want them to be suffering in polluted environments and go extinct through some unpleasant um, cause. Um, and then there are more pragmatic reasons for being concerned about wildlife conservation um, and not just animals but the, the ecosystem in general and those are because uh, as we all know they provide us with a lot of things that we need and um, I think a lot of us assume that our, our quality of life of our children will be reduced if we don't try and maintain at least the current um, quality of our environment if, if not ideally improve it over what we have, have right now. So in the future, you know, it's going to be really important for zoos to continue that kind of evolutionary process where um, uh, maybe a hundred years ago or even 50 years ago, depending on the zoo, it was just a menagerie. It was a place for people to come and appreciate animals and, and plants um, and, and ecosystems that they wouldn't necessarily come in touch with um, in their real lives. But we've become so much more than that, um, almost on the whole. Zoos all over the world, not even just in the United States, but zoos all over the world are really taking up these challenges and seeing that if we don't do anything, we're not going to have that inspirational message to members of the public anymore. We won't be able to tell them about elephants in the wild just by having an elephant in front of them in a zoo. If there aren't any elephants in the wild, it'll mostly just be a really um, a hard story to tell. So uh, even more so than we are now, uh, we really need to shift to, to um, making our, our primary priority conservation.